Are we going to allow AI to decide who lives and who dies? If we can't even draw the line there and say that, no, we're not going to allow AI to be built to anonymously murder anybody, then who are we kidding if we think we're going to be able to exclude any uses of AI? We have already seen real-world use cases of these weapons types, and we're seeing reports of development and use of these weapons at an accelerating rate. So we decided to make a film to illustrate very clearly that the issue is you make these autonomous weapons, you can launch them uh, by the million or the 10 million uh, and wipe out entire human populations quite deliberately. And that makes as much sense as selling nuclear weapons in a supermarket. So the film is structured in three parts. The first part of the film is to remind us of the risks of these types of weapons and to illustrate the endpoint that we are rapidly driving towards with today's technological developments. What we see there is a world in which autonomous weapons have proliferated outside of military hands and into the hands of non-state actors, civilians, and police forces alike. The second part of the film talks about the rhetoric and the thinking and the technological developments that we're already seeing today that are driving us towards that endpoint with autonomous weapons. And the third part of the film aims to show us what can we do about this? How can we mitigate this risk by acting today? And that is based on the real world policy proposal that has been outlined by the ICRC, by the Red Cross. And that is slated to be debated by the UN at a meeting later this December. And this part of the film aims to be hopeful. It aims to show us that we can still act to mitigate this risk. We can draw a red line on a prohibition of autonomous weapon systems that are designed or used to target people. It also shows us that we can set a powerful precedent by steering AI in a direction towards safe and ethical use. My name is Stuart Russell. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of California, Berkeley. I've been doing artificial intelligence for more than 40 years. I'm Max Tegmark, uh, a professor doing AI research at MIT, and also uh, the president and one of the founders of the Future Life Institute. Hi, I'm Dr. Amelia Jaworski, and I am a physician, a scientist, and an entrepreneur. I believe that artificial intelligence can help life flourish like never before if uh, the wisdom with which we manage it grows faster than its power. Now, the key to having this huge upside from artificial intelligence is going to be to make sure that we don't pervert this technology into uh, destabilizing stupid uses. I feel uh, a particular responsibility to make sure that AI is used for good uh, and banning autonomous weapons uh, is one of the best things we can do to make sure that happens. I work with the Future of Life Institute, which is a nonprofit organization focused on mitigating the risks of powerful technologies. Over the past few years, I have been leading our efforts on the topic of lethal autonomous weapon systems. That's why I'm so excited to share with you If Human Kill. We are live with Brett Hauer on the line, from where police are now confirming a drive-by shooting at a polling station. They're all in a line, shot in the head, just where they stood. The whole line is dead. The line is dead? Looks like some voters had children with them. All spared, not even hurt. Brett, local PD are saying a suspicious device may have been discovered. Could this be Slaughterbots? No parts on the ground. I can I haven't heard any or heard of any airborne devices. I, I see police. I see some officers deploying camouflage masks right now. We're on the move. Police are interested in an abandoned vehicle. They're heavily camouflaged now. Wait, there's a, there's another vehicle, an another vehicle across the street. They seem quite concerned about that. Look, look out! Look out! Get a 
another national security crisis for this administration. Everybody was dancing and, and then suddenly we heard... Horrible. The world in which we fail to draw a red line on autonomous weapons means that the types of things we see and hear in part one of this film will be really imminently upon us. Here, clearly, one political party has decided that they, by attacking uh, poll lines in areas that the other political party dominates, um, they can scare people away from the polls and win elections that way. Um, we're already seeing uh, drug cartels using remotely controlled drones uh, to assassinate members of opposing cartels. Uh, it's very likely that they uh, would use these weapons if they were widely manufactured and available. They would use these weapons to carry out their, uh, their campaigns of terror uh, against the military, against the police, against civilian populations, and against each other. This scene highlights that lethal autonomous weapons are a weapon of mass destruction in that it enables very few to kill very many. Because they don't require human supervision to carry out the attack. If you wanted to use a million remotely piloted drones uh, to kill everyone in Afghanistan, you would need a million pilots and another 15 million support personnel uh, to manage all those weapons. Uh, but with fully autonomous weapons, with slaughterbots, uh, you only need one or two people to define the mission uh, and release the weapons. People who think we can avoid immoral things being done with slaughterbots by putting in some sort of ethics chip into it, forget that the person who determines what's morally good and morally bad is the owner of the slaughterbot, who will, might decide that everybody with this skin color is bad and should be killed. Robots have no moral conscience of their own. They'll just do exactly as they're told. The technology is able to overcome the countermeasures used by the police, which are special camouflage masks to hide the fact that they're human beings. Um, but the slaughterbots uh, seem to be able to evade this countermeasure, actually uh, to recognize the police as, as targets, even though they're wearing the camouflage masks. So this points to the fact that uh, these weapons can evolve very quickly uh, to defeat countermeasures. Uh, they can be reprogrammed because it's only a software question. It's not a matter of redesigning the hardware. Uh, so you can reprogram them overnight uh, to defeat a countermeasure. The tech that was used in the slaughterbots in this scene had three components. The targeting, the killing, and the flying. The flying is just trivial, quite a little quadcopter, GPS con controlled. The killing, it's very easy to do with a very low, low weight explosive, for example. The targeting is something you already have in your smartphone, where you, it looks at you and unlocks because it recognizes your face. It's quite easy to use face recognition to instead just see, hey, is this a child that we should spare or is it an adult we should kill? Maybe in, you look at the skin color of the person and use that to decide who you're going to kill. The autonomous weapon operates a bit like a chess program, which decides where to move the pieces and which of the enemy pieces to kill. Um, so it's not a mysterious, spooky, emergent consciousness thing. It's the same type of autonomy that our chess programs and Go programs and other game-playing programs have had for decades. All the tech needed for this already exists. And it's just a matter of integrating it and, and mass producing it. I think the number one reason why lethal autonomous weapons haven't already been banned is just a bunch of misconceptions about what they are. On many occasions, um, national governments and senior defense officials have talked about the only problem uh, with autonomous weapons is what happens if they become conscious uh, and decide that they hate human beings and start killing us at random, right? Um, I've talked to senior defense officials who literally said that they have talked to their expert advisors uh, and they've been assured that Skynet, uh, the, uh, the conscious computer system that directed the Terminators uh, in the Terminator films, that Skynet is not a real possibility. Uh, and so we don't need to worry about any of these bad scenarios. Um, the German government said that an, a weapon is not autonomous uh, unless it is fully self-aware. Um, 
So when you have defense officials and governments talking complete nonsense uh, about a subject of such international importance, we felt uh, that we had failed. The word lethal in lethal Thomas weapons means that they kill humans. So an automatic uh, anti-aircraft missile, for example, or anti-tank missile is not a lethal weapon because it shoots at a tank and an aircraft. And a lethal Thomas weapon will only kill people that are not sitting inside of tanks that are just walking around doing their thing. That's why they're a dream come true for criminals and terrorists who want to wipe out a certain ethnic group, say. The word autonomous in lethal Thomas weapons means that it's the algorithm itself that decides who lives and who dies, which means that cruise missiles, for instance, are not lethal autonomous weapons, and nor are the drones that are remote controlled, because in both cases, the decision about what the target is made by a human being. And finally, many people think of Terminator or some sort of two-legged robot when they think about lethal autonomous weapons, which is pretty useless from a military point of view. But what's much more popular in its effectiveness are flying things in swarms or alone, little um, things like you'll see in our film, and uh, various other types of embodiments uh, that look absolutely nothing like a two-legged uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, no, no. Killer robots marching down the street? That can't happen. These are professional munitions, and they aren't just going to fall into the hands of bad guys. We're building really robust procedures. A whole constellation of products at the trade show this year. This is an industry energized by last year's successes. Devices apparently hunted down and killed soldiers who were regrouping after fleeing the battlefield. Of course, they can't target kids in the street. They are hard-coded to target men in the battle space. That's well, surely you mean men and women. Well, sure. It can be added to the target profile. Purely a military device for confronting military aggression. Nobody is endorsing civilian applications. The second such autonomous assassination of leading scientists. Big win for regional powers, as they hope to cripple their neighbor's nuclear program. Se cree que el ataque fue llevado a cabo por slotobots. The design obstacles are dropping like dominoes. We are getting more lethal, more versatile, more affordable, so we can empower more customers. Regime change without the billion dollars spent or the body bags. A real lift to the smallest armies. Legitimate armies, though? Well, sure, but who are we to decide who they are? The second section of this film is really aimed to mirror what we're seeing happening today. Now, these might seem a little over the top and exaggerated, but this is modeled on the real world rhetoric that we've even heard in our discussions with diplomats and people who are in favor of developing these types of weapons. This idea that don't worry, we'll build robust verification procedures. Yes, proliferation's an issue and escalation's an issue, but we'll deal with that when the time comes. So I've heard the argument that autonomous weapons won't fall into the hands of the bad guys. It's like saying, well, let's build machine guns. And of course, criminals will never, ever get access to machine guns. Crime gangs will never have them. But we know for a fact that that's not true. Proliferation is pretty much inevitable when you have weapons that are really cheap and really small. For example, the United States simply lost 200,000 AR-15 automatic rifles in Iraq. Uh, they have no idea where they went. Uh, there are 100 million Kalashnikovs in private hands. The uh, STM cargo drone, uh, which is produced by a government-owned corporation in Turkey, uh, was sold to one of the factions in the Libya conflict, despite the presence of a very strict United Nations arms embargo. So, in fact, there appears to be very uh, few controls, if any, on the proliferation of these weapons. So the way this will work is that arms manufacturers uh, produce large quantities of weapons. They go to trade fairs all over the world, many of them completely unregulated or taking place in countries like North Korea or Syria, um, where uh, there are really no controls uh, on who gets what. Um, and then arms dealers buy them, they pass them sh through shell companies to uh, drug gangs, uh, to 
human smugglers uh, to factions fighting in civil wars to terrorist groups. Um, and all of these groups are extremely well armed. Um, and you can be absolutely sure that they are not manufacturing those weapons by themselves. Slaughterbots is just a tiny fraction of all the militarily useful things you can do with AI weapons. So the arms industry would be just fine if we banned them, but if we don't ban them, of course they're gonna sell those too. The only reason they wouldn't is if they're illegal, like bioweapons. The balance of power is an interesting question in this debate. Uh, do we want to tip the balance of power away from uh, the major powers um, who have uh, long histories of uh, learning to abide by constraints on the use of military power uh, and tip the balance in favor of rogue nations, non-state actors uh, who are uh, able to act in ways that are completely unconstrained by moral or political or economic consequences of their actions. I think it's inevitable that the development of these weapons would reduce international security for pretty much every country. They are largely uh, effective as uh, weapons of attack and not as weapons of defense. The particular concern that I have is the small anti-personnel weapon, the, uh, the so-called swarm weapon, uh, which could be extremely effective, not just against, uh, for example, infantry formations, but also against human populations, civilian populations. Autonomous weapons in many ways make ideal tools for assassination. Uh, you can be hundreds of miles away when the attack takes place. Uh, it can be completely unattributable. Um, and all the security measures that are currently taken, for example, to protect political figures, uh, would be useless because uh, you don't require a line of sight uh, you don't have to have somebody with a sniper rifle holed up in a hotel uh, that has direct line of sight to the politician. So um, I know for a fact that uh, the fear of assassination is uppermost in the minds of many governments uh, as they think about the risks of autonomous weapons. And we only have to think back to World War I, which was precipitated by the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Um, that once you get into tit-for-tat assassinations and politicians, uh, you can very quickly uh, devolve into a full-scale war. I think another important point is that delegating the decision to kill humans to an algorithm is a deliberate devaluing of human life. Uh, the people that I've spoken to in the military take that responsibility extremely seriously and handing it over to an algorithm and saying, I can't be bothered to worry about it. I'm not going to put myself at risk. Uh, we're just going to have the algorithm do all the killing uh, is a complete abdication of responsibility uh, and puts the value of human life uh, far lower than it should be. The other idea that we could just have wars where only robots die um, doesn't really make sense at all. Uh, if you could prosecute a war and win without any human casualties on either side, then you might as well play baseball or tiddlywinks to decide who wins the war. In a real war, one side only surrenders when the amount of damage inflicted on their populations, their uh, control infrastructure, uh, their, um, their factories, um, their cities becomes unsustainable. Uh, and that's true whether the damage is being inflicted by robots or by human soldiers. So another one of the big concerns about autonomous weapons is accidental escalation of warfare. So if you have fully autonomous defense systems that can retaliate against what is perceived as an attack, um, then you could imagine this happening even without a real attack. Uh, on several occasions in the history of nuclear weapons, for example, uh, our early detection systems have uh, detected a nuclear attack that wasn't actually happening. It was only human intervention that prevented a full-scale nuclear war from taking place. 
The reason that we chose to make If Human Kill was to pick up where Slaughterbots 1 left off. Slaughterbots 1 warned us of an emerging risk that we were going to face. When we presented Slaughterbots at the CCW in 2017, uh, many people dismissed it as science fiction. For example, the Russian ambassador said, why are we even discussing this? This is 25 or 30 years in the future. It's just science fiction. Um, but when we presented it to people in the AI community, uh, as they were watching the CEO demonstrating the weapon and talking about its use for mass attacks, uh, the AI researchers thought that this was a real video, not a fictional presentation, but this was a real recording of a real CEO. So they obviously considered the technology to be entirely feasible. Uh, meanwhile, uh, a Turkish company called STM was preparing the public announcement for their weapon, the Kargu Autonomous Drone, uh, which was announced about three weeks after we presented the video um, and advertised as having the capability for autonomous hits using face recognition and human tracking. Cargo drones from the Turkish STM company were used in Libya to hunt down fleeing humans, according to a United Nations report. And we just don't know whether these were soldiers or whether they were just some random uh, Libyan truck drivers that had been contracted or what. Then the company obviously is not sharing any information with us. At the time, a lot of people were like, ah, oh, forget it. They're decades and decades away. Well, they were wrong because now they're already here. And so the next part of the story for us was to talk about what is the kind of thinking that is fueling our development of these weapons and moving towards that horrific endpoint that was shown in Slaughterbots 1? But more importantly, what is it that we can do about it to avert that outcome? And how can we really take this opportunity of autonomous weapons not only to avert a really dire outcome for humanity, but also help steer AI and set a powerful precedent for how AI can be used for good and be used safely and ethically? And this idea of of a red line and drawing a red line as a global community that machines must never decide who lives and who dies is, is really a first step in that direction. Right now we're going to cross the UN where we're told the treaty has now been signed. Generations before us thought that future wars would be fought with toxic chemicals and infectious germs. They thought our landscapes would be littered with unexploded landmines. And more recently, it seemed inevitable we were on a course to mass-produce a new class of merciless, autonomous weapons which use algorithms to decide who to kill. We knew the dangers, but we thought we had no choice. Because we thought our enemies were too inhuman to respect innocent lives. We thought if we didn't, they would. But each time we feared the worst, we were wrong. Together, our nations have ratified a new, legally binding treaty. Together, we prohibit weapons which select human targets and attack without human control. Humanity must prevail on the battlefield, and from today, it will. So the third section of the film at its most literal level is a fictionalized version of the real world policy proposal for autonomous weapons that is currently being debated. 
And so that's at the heart of what the fictionalized Secretary General is saying in, in this speech, is imagining what would our world look like on the day that we actually agreed to a treaty on autonomous weapons. So in this last scene, we see the drone come in and is looming overhead. And given all we've experienced up until this point, we assume that it's going to make the decision of who to kill of these two humans locked in this complex standoff. But it doesn't. It de-escalates the situation, and both people make it out alive. To me, the drone represents our hopeful future with technology, where it is used not to undermine our humanity, but to build on it and to advance it. In the earlier parts of the film, we see human beings through the lens of technology, as code, in screens, and through cameras. But in this part of the film, we revert to a cinematic style of filmmaking to really illuminate the human element and to know that human beings are not just sensor data, we're human beings. And in this scene, we see a tense standoff between two individuals who are trying to navigate the complexity of one another's humanity in impossible circumstances of war. And what this scene really says to me and what we see in the trade-offs and the dynamics between these two individuals is that there are certain elements of being human and navigating the humanity of another that will never be a capability of an algorithm or of a machine. We start out with if human kill, and we end at if human protect. The kill protect dichotomy is really representative of the options that lie before us for our future with AI. There are very few outcomes to be imagined where our future with AI is incremental or middle of the road. It's either going to be one which is flourishing and incredible and advances our humanity, or one that is very dark and destabilizing and undermines it. And so this is the decision that's before us today. Here with autonomous weapons is the first step. Which one are we going to choose? To kill or to protect? If we can't even agree that we don't want to let people legally build and sell AI systems that can on their own go off and decide who to kill and kill them. I mean, who are we kidding? They were ever going to draw the line anywhere, right? Whereas if we can win that battle, we've set the precedent that there are some things that are off limits and we can steer this amazing technology towards a future that I think we will all be really, really excited to find ourselves in. So this film is really timely in that while it's a work of fiction, it's something that is illuminating a very, very real world and applied circumstances that we're, we're chatting through today. It also is helping us to ground in what's ahead. And as we think towards global action on this issue, we have this amazing opportunity, which is a once in five year meeting of the UN in December to debate this issue specifically. And we have this incredible moment in which we can draw this red line and mitigate this risk of autonomous weapons. And so that for us was key in developing this film was we wanted to be able to remind people that this risk is here, and but there's still something we can do about it if we act now. So the policy prescription for autonomous weapons, there is a great piece that has been put forth by the ICRC, which is the International Committee of the Red Cross. It's an independent organization and they're largely seen as the custodians of the law of war. And their policy proposal has three pillars. The first being a prohibition, a legally binding prohibition, that's important, on systems with high degrees of unpredictable behavior. The second, which is the policy proposal that we explore in the film, is a legally binding prohibition on autonomous weapons that are designed or used to target humans. And the last one is the need to develop regulations on other types of autonomous weapons. So you can think of that class as sort of an autonomous fighter jet against autonomous fighter jet, where the target is not actually a human being. And these three pillars are to be debated by the UN at the meeting in December as to whether or not to act and take these up. 
So a key element of a policy prescription for lethal autonomous weapons in this ICRC position is the idea of a legally binding instrument, right? Legally binding means new law, a new treaty. Now this is important because that does not mean a political declaration or a political promise or some strong statement. There really is, when we look throughout the history of disarmament affairs, no more important tool than a legally binding instrument in order to exert a real meaningful effect on the behavior of states and also generating a diplomatic and social stigma around a class of weapons. We've seen this before with landmines, we've seen it with bioweapons, with chemical weapons. Legally binding is, is central to whatever sort of path forward we take. So there are plenty of historical examples of where legally binding treaties were used to mitigate the risks of powerful technologies. The bioweapons ban, the chemical weapons ban, bans on blinding lasers, the list goes on. The bioweapons ban in particular is one that we really see as a great example for the future with autonomous weapons. The bioweapons ban took the weaponization of biology and germ warfare off of the table. And that unlocked biology as a field to be one that we associate with new medicines, curing diseases, and transforming agriculture. That's the fate that we hope a new legally binding instrument will have for artificial intelligence. By avoiding its weaponization, we will unlock its positive potential to steer us towards a similarly flourishing future for the science. The argument that autonomous weapons have a high degree of military effectiveness and therefore uh, no one's going to agree to ban them, uh, probably isn't true. Uh, chemical weapons were quite effective in World War I. Uh, if you read the, uh, the memoir of the Russian gentleman who was uh, in charge of a large part of their biological weapons program in the um, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, he believes that uh, Russian use of biological weapons in World War II was uh, extremely important uh, in helping to defeat the Germans. And so uh, there's no doubt that the U.S. and Russia believed biological weapons were a very, very important part of their defense programs. Um, and yet we were able to ban them. The argument that was used initially um, in the US by biologists and chemists was that if these weapons become widely available, they will be cheap, effective weapons of mass destruction that will proliferate to non-state actors, to rogue nations, to smaller countries, and tip the balance of power away from the major powers, uh, and thereby reducing the security of the United States. Uh, that argument was persuasive to Richard Nixon, who unilaterally abandoned the U.S. biological weapons program, not because it was ineffective, but because it would become effective. And if that happened, would reduce the security of the United States. So are we doomed, right? Is our fate sealed with autonomous weapons and we should all just invest in a bunker? Now, there's many reasons why you may sincerely want to invest in a bunker, but I sincerely believe that autonomous weapons should not be one of them. And so with this film, we really aim to show that, yes, action is possible. This is what it could look like. And this is why we need to do it now. So what is it that you can do about autonomous weapons? Learn more about it. You can find out more by going to autonomousweapons.org. If you want the future free of slaughterbots, please share this film on social media. And please make sure that the people who are going to be making these decisions actually understand how much you care about this, because this is an incredibly important watershed. Uh, and try uh, to uh, move your country, your fellow citizens, in the direction of supporting a treaty. If you are a journalist, you have an enormous opportunity to actually influence what happens to get the happy ending we saw in this film. The main reason that this hasn't been solved already is because these perspectives are almost never made available to the broader public. And therefore, 
the decision makers never hear from the broader public about the need to actually do something about it. If you are a person who works in artificial intelligence, you should know that the vast majority of your colleagues already support this idea of banning lethal Thomas weapons. We've done a lot of work at FLI to develop both open letters and pledges to never develop or work on these systems and to support the kind of regulation that is being put forth by the ICRC. So please make your voice heard and don't let the few rotten eggs you know, ruin the reputation of your field for you. The same way that biologists stood up and said, hey, we want biology to stand for saving lives. Uh, make sure that your field gets remembered as a field that helps find new solutions, not uh, the field that um, kind of ruined our open society with slaughterbots. And if you're a member of the diplomatic community, it's time to act. It's time to adopt these types of policy frameworks that are clear, that are concise, and that are ready to go. And so encouraging bold action from our policymakers is really what the world needs today. So at present, the topic of autonomous weapons is being discussed at the CCW in Geneva. Uh, the CCW process is a consensus process. So it requires essentially every nation to go along with an agreement to have a discussion uh, to go along with drafting the terms of a treaty uh, and to agree to the treaty. Um, an alternative is the UN General Assembly, which doesn't require unanimity. Uh, and I think that would reflect better the interests of the people of the world who over and over again in polls have shown that they are very strongly opposed to the development of these kinds of weapons. If you are part of the United Nations CCW process, then please vote no in December to any extension of the CCW's mandate beyond this year, unless there's a clear resolution to ban lethal autonomous weapons. Otherwise, the CCW is not part of the solution. It's just standing in the way of the solution, preventing this issue from going to a different forum that can actually handle it and give us the ban that we need. Steering the future of technology is hard, but it's worth doing because the upside, if we get it right, is just tremendous.